back in April 2019, I reached out to my guest today, and in October, we finally conducted this interview you're about to hear. So I had seen some of his economic theory articles on a website called Mises.org, which I had been turned on to by the Tom Woods Show. Anyway, he has the best breakdown of how interest works and the moral repercussions of biblical lending and unbiblical lending. He didn't say it that way, but I was able to connect what he was saying with God's law, and so I knew I at least had to reach out. So he's the clearest teacher that I've found on how banking works, and if I can get off track here for just a second, here's what he cleared up for me. So there's two distinct functions that used to be totally separate in banking. So the first one is paying a bank to protect your stuff. And that's one where obviously you're hiring the bank. But then the second one, and these used to be completely distinct, is where the bank hires you or they buy your money. So you save money at a bank and you're basically lending it your money, which then they pay interest on. So it's sort of like the bank buys your money at a wholesale price, lots of smaller amounts, and then it turns around and sells your money at retail and splits the interest with you. So I I recommend that you look up some of his lectures on YouTube. He's a fantastic teacher, very clear, and able to distill ideas down to their essence really well. His name is Robert Murphy. He's a Christian and economist. He is a research assistant professor with the Free Market Institute at Texas Tech. He's a senior fellow with the Mises Institute, and he co-hosts with Tom Woods on their podcast called Contra Krugman. So we start off, we talk about Bob's story from nominal Catholicism to atheism to Christ, reconciling Paul's commands to be subject to authority with Christian anarchism and anarcho-capitalism, socialism in the early church, mandatory charity enforcement in the Bible, capital punishment, life ransoms for crimes, lawful slavery, negligent homicide insurance, and a lot more things. Bob turned the tables on me and started digging into my ideas in this interview, and we had a fantastic time. I think it will be well worth your time, and it was definitely worth my wait. Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. See, I have taught you statutes and rules, as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. Who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? My name's Adam Terrell, and I'm here to encourage you to obey the law and think about it and speak about it constantly. I broke the law. Christ paid my debt by sacrificing himself so that I can be clean to offer myself as a living sacrifice back to God. The entire Mosaic law is obligatory for everyone. Keeping some of the laws look different today because the light of further revelation supersedes shadows in the old law. The temple sacrifices are an example where we have something better. Note that we must still obey the Mosaic laws for sacrifices. There is still a temple, and priests are still required to offer sacrifices. It's just that the priests, the sacrifices, and the temple are all better now. God will show grace to those who apply the law to themselves, to those who have hidden the law in their hearts, and he will judge those who disobey accordingly. I must apply it to myself, and then those around me will see its fruit and be drawn to its goodness. Theocracy grows by the sword of the Spirit, God's word, and self-sacrifice. The law's purpose is to give a path to restoration. Christ has restored me, so I must seek to restore others by sacrificing myself. Thanks for listening. My goal with each conversation is to edify and bring the law and wisdom to bear on each person's current situation in life. So I was raised Catholic. My parents are Catholic. You know, they still go to Catholic church. I went up through confirmation in terms of Catholic sacraments. And then in, and I was, I started out like, as I think I called myself a conservative briefly, like in junior high. And then I became a libertarian and I just kept reading and I realized, oh no, I really like, 
uh, of the of the so-called conservatives that I was reading, it was Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams that I liked the most. And so I realized, oh, actually, actually, I'm a libertarian, and I really like the economics angle. Found Murray Rothbard, Henry Hazlitt, Mises, and so forth, and realized, oh, I'm an Austrian economist in the libertarian tradition. And it was probably and so as I went into college, I'm not sure exactly the timeline, but I got more and more skeptical about religion. And at some point, I think for is that, I think for sure by the time I was in college. I considered myself an atheist. And in fact, what I said was a, a devout atheist, meaning like I was going to... Wow. I planned on writing a book that was going to blow up Christianity because I, I had read other critiques, Mencken's Treatise on the Gods, and I think George Smith had a book on atheism, and I thought they were fine. You, know, Thomas Paine's The Age of Reason, which is a, not a critique. You know, he was a deist, but it was a critique of Christianity. And I thought, oh, yeah, all good stuff, guys, but, you know, I'm really going to get into it. Um, and I became an anarcho-capitalist in undergrad too, that, that was what, you know, up till then I'd been resisting and just kind of thought, well, you need the government to have police and the military. And so so for various reasons, because of learning more about history and just thinking through the theory and reading more Rothbard stuff, I think that's what pushed me over the edge in that score. And then, um, you know, I'll, I'll just say it real briefly. And then, you know, depending on how you want to take the conversation, if you want to elaborate or want me to elaborate, in in grad school, I went through, I had this like sort of epiphany when I realized certain things that I had thought about myself for a long time were wrong, and I realized like I wasn't as good as I thought I had been, and like I just thought through different interactions I'd had over the years and went back and apologized to some people. I realized, oh wow, you know the way I the way I came off to them was was much worse than in my head what what I was doing that sort of thing, and because of that. It was um, like I had uh, I had had some like issues with my skin, like my skin was like real flaking off like around my nose and stuff at this time. So this was in grad school and I was going to see dermatologists and they couldn't, you know, they were just giving me stuff that was making it worse. And, you know, I just was getting real disgusted with them. And when I had this epiphany, you know, in terms of just realizing certain things that were going on socially with my life and I had this, you know, realization all this stress, I could just like literally feel it just drain out of me. And I knew instantly, oh, my skin problems are going to clear up. Like, in other words, I had gotten so used to carrying around all that stress and anxiety that I forgot. I was, I didn't realize how heavy a burden that had been just because I gotten so used, I turned into such an expert in carrying it. And so when it drained away, I mean, it, it was like instant. Like I really just, boom, it hit me. It wasn't like this gradual unfolding over the process. It was like, within like five seconds, like I just had this flood of memories that made me realize, oh, wow, like my theory of who I am and everything and how I've lived my life is totally or not totally wrong, but there's a major problem with it, a flaw in my self-image. And once that clicked and all that anxiety and stuff washed away, I instantly knew, oh, yeah, this this stuff with my skin that, you know, that's because of all the stress. Like I just knew that was going to be gone. And I, you know, I threw out my the whatever bottles and stuff or they were giving me. And so when that happened, then I said, Oh wow. So that's probably what was going on with that guy. Jesus that he really thought he was the Messiah. All right. So he was crazy. I thought, you know, cause everyone knows, you know, there's no such thing as God and you gotta be rational and scientific. Right. But at that point, so like I amended my theory is because before I just thought it was a bunch of myths and some guys made up some crazy stories. And for some reason it stuck, but I kind of knew that didn't make sense. And also, um, H. L. Mencken and his treatise on the gods. I was really astounded that he. Um, I don't remember his exact words, but I'm pretty sure his explanation for the success of Christianity was that Jesus really did come back from the dead. I mean, whether Mencken thought he was clinically dead or not, I don't know. But in other words, people thought he had been crucified and then saw him again a few days later, walking around talking to people. And so I was really surprised when I read that because I would just assume Mencken would have said this is all myth. But that was the way Mencken made sense of the evidence to say this guy actually must have apparently, you know, come back from the dead. Otherwise, you can't really explain what happened historically. Hmm. So because that was still you know lurking in the background, then when I had this personal experience, then my new updated best explanation for everything to explain the evidence was there was this guy, Jesus. He was raised, you know, as a as a Jew and knew the prophecies and whatnot and erroneously believed he was the fulfillment of those prophecies. So he's going around telling people their sins are forgiven and healing them. And since I had just 
personally experienced, you know, the, the power of the mind over the body, which before I kind of thought was hocus pocus and, you know, new age feel good gobbledygook since I experienced it myself and realized, wow, if your image of yourself mentally changes, like there can be physical ramifications of that, like almost right away. That so then I thought, oh, okay. So I mean, like if you think about it, like lepers were kind of like me, except times a thousand. You know, like I had had skin problems, and I knew they were instantly going to be fixed once you know I got my head straight, as it were. And so that's kind of like, oh, so I could now believe if a guy went around and told them you're healed, and they truly believed it, they could be healed. Okay, so I didn't think he was divine. I just like I understood now more. I guess I would have called it a power of suggestion or something. And so that was kind of the thing. I'll, I'll, I realize I'm taking a long time here on your first question. So that's kind of w- where it started. And then just more and more, I kept painting myself into a corner in terms of trying to come up with the back. And after a while, I realized, okay, well, you know, I've basically gotten to the point where I'm saying, yeah, there was this guy and he predicted his death and he came back from the dead. And, and but, oh, he wasn't really, and at what point am I going to say, yeah, that's what the world would look like if the Christian story were true, you know? <laughs> So it was like I, right. it, after a certain point, it was like I was being ridiculous and trying to say, oh, but it wasn't miraculous. It was just these things happened. It was like, come on, where are the chances that all lined up? And so um, and, and at that point, too, like and there was some other stuff, too, that I'm, I'm gliding over just because I don't want to take too long in your first question here. But eventually I, um, you know, I, I had a, a, another sort of direct. Well, I'll just tell it really fast. There were some other things going on. And I got to the point where I uh, said, okay, if one more thing happens, then I'm going to believe that there's a God. And one more thing did happen. And at that moment, I was racked with intense guilt because I remembered, like in college in particular, I was going around trying to talk my Christian friends out of their faith. And, and I wasn't doing it maliciously. I thought I was freeing them from superstition. Right. You're you're evangelizing them back with, with what's <laughs> right. really true. Yeah. And so fortunately... I, to my knowledge, nobody, you know, bit like they, they all rejected my, uh, my false, uh, attempts, it, but I was really, I was like, Oh man. And so, and I, and I said out loud, I'm so sorry. Like I was apologizing to you know this God that I now realized existed. And, you know, I know atheists hearing this are going to think I just had to say this to assuage my guilt, but I heard a voice in my head say, I forgive you. Like there, that it was not me thinking it like I, it was another being that I heard and it wasn't, you know, audible in the room. Like somebody else in the room wouldn't have heard. Like I just knew and it's hard to explain it. I'm just saying it's like sometimes like you're having a dream and you kind of just know things. And then if you're trying to tell someone else the dream, it's not obvious. Like, how did you know that as a, as the first person observer in the dream, but yet you just kind of didn't know it in the dream. It was like that. Like it, I know I was hearing somebody else say that and it wasn't my ears hearing it. And so that that's how I do it. But and I I wasn't a Christian at that point. I mean, I went through. I looked. You know, I was researching Buddhism and Confucius and all this other stuff, and you know, uh, Hinduism. And it just it, it kind of I realized this is ridiculously shallow. But I got the sense that like Buddhism was more about oh, the way you deal with suffering is to try to convince yourself it's not suffering, or like who can say whether it's good or bad, which just seemed crazy to me. Whereas it seemed like Jesus was saying, oh, yeah, there's suffering, but here's how you deal with it. You know what I mean? Like, I'm here and, you know, you have to trust that God has a plan and he'll turn the suffering to a good purpose. So you, you didn't have to deny that it was evil. Um, so in any event, it was just and then, you know, I, I, I started going back to church and I found a good Protestant church and that just made the most sense to me. And going and rereading the Bible with fresh uh, eyes I was seeing stuff that I had never, you know, seen before. And so that's, I'll, I'll, st- I'll stop there. So was there a particular person that you encountered that really sort of helped open up the scriptures to you in terms of, well, and also let me ask you this. Um, was there anything that sort of seemed to conflict with anarcho-capitalism and Christianity? And how did you deal with those or are still dealing with them? Okay. So yeah. So the, as far as the, the person who most opened up my eyes, it would probably be the guy, his name's Henry Bellow. Um, 
and he it was a non denominational church. I'm not sure if you tried to pin him down and say like what you know what particular sect are you? I, I don't know because even what he would say like I don't, I don't remember because again like I was coming from a Catholic tradition, so I didn't know what you know the difference between a Baptist and Presbyterian. I didn't know any of that stuff, and uh, but I just started going to this one church, and this guy was just you know he he was on fire. You know he was just real passionate. And he was from. Gosh, this is embarrassing. I, I forget which country he was. He was from Africa, like literally from there. And so he had this cool accent and everything. And he would just, you know, he'd pray be like, oh, Heavenly Father, you are the Alpha and the Omega. You know, he would just get you so fired up. And like, that's what I really needed. <laughs> and, um, you know, because when I was growing up, like going to church was a chore. It was like, oh, you got to go to church on Sunday. And then you check the box and then you go watch football, you know, that kind of thing. Whereas here, it was like at this stage in my life. I by Wednesday I was drained and I needed to get back to church to recharge my batteries. You know, it was that kind of thing. And um, so, in any event, it's. Uh, but when uh, I got married, he was in the in the pre marriage counseling. He had like this survey, and one of them was, um, uh, you know, one of the questions was something like, "When you die and stand before." God, you know, what will you say to, for admission into heaven? It was something like yeah, that. Yeah, evangelism explosion. Yeah. And and I just said, I mean, I'm embarrassed to tell you this, you know, Adam, now, but my answer I wrote down was something like, well, at times when it was difficult, even though it was difficult, I tried to speak the truth or something like that. Like, that's what I put. And he would, you know, basically told me, no, that's wrong, Bob, and like use scripture to show me. And the thing that's amazing is I'm sitting here telling you this. It wasn't even so much the content of what he showed me. Your listeners can imagine the obvious passages he would have shown, you know, like man's righteousness is filthy rags and stuff like that. But um, it was more, I was astonished that he thought there was an objective answer to a theological question. Because up to, I I always kind of thought it was like, well, who, who knows the mind of God? He can do whatever he wants. And who are we to even speculate? You get what I'm saying? Like, so just try to be a good person. And then you'll see how it shakes out in the afterlife. Like, that's kind of what I thought. And I've heard, uh, I'm not just trying to throw Catholics under the bus here, but I've heard other Catholics say that too. So I don't know if that's just a, a, a American Catholic. I mean, I realize that's not official Catholic doctrine, so I don't want to get a bunch of angry Catholics biting my head off here. But I'm just saying, I went, you know, I went to two Catholic schools. I passed a bunch of exams, you know, in terms of, you know, religion class when I went through them my high school was called Thomas Aquinas high school, you know, and I was confirmed. And so I got that far and that was the answer I wrote down, which is demonstrably wrong, of course. So anyway, I'm just saying it was, that was the guy that really showed me like, no, you can actually read the Bible to know, you know, what, what God thinks. And I realized how goofy it sounds for me to say that to you. But up until that point, I didn't, uh, you know, that didn't click with me. So, so yeah, if I had to name one person who really, you know, opened up my eyes and said, okay, if you want to understand how God is and what his character is and so forth, read the Bible. When I realize again, as I'm mm-hmm. telling you this, how ludicrous that sounds for me to say. Um, as far as, kind of, I mean, I, Romans 13 is probably the most obvious example, and I still, I don't want to say I struggle with it, but it's, sometimes I think Christian libertarians are too flippant and glib yes. when they just dismiss that so quickly. I want to say, no, no, I mean, come on. He says some stuff here, the prima facie, it sure sounds like that's not libertarian at all. And so just if we're, in other words, if we can dismiss that so easily by saying, oh, that he can't possibly mean that. Well, then you could say just about anything Paul wrote. Right. Well, and there's another passage as well that says to teach them to be subject to rulers and authorities. And so it's like, there's the whole anarchist thing, which mm-hmm. I, I agree a lot with um, in terms of like, well, the whole question of Romans 13 is, well, what is a ruler? Right. A ruler is somebody who's a terror to evil and not a terror to good. So anybody who does the opposite of that, which is a lot of people today, they're not legitimate rulers in whatever area that they neglect to fit the definition of what a ruler is. Yeah. So I like that. And I've also heard people say, too, that, well, to understand Romans 13, you got to read Romans 12. You know, and that, <laughs> who could deny that? You know, that? That's such a great answer. And going along with what you're saying there. Um, and I, I, let me, if you don't mind me asking you, do you think Paul was being deliberately, mis, well, let's say vague at least, and possibly even misleading, like along the lines of Jesus saying, you know, render under Caesars, and you're not even really sure what is he saying there? Like, does he mean pay the taxes or not? Because it depends, you know, is it rightfully Caesars or not? Right. Well, the whole question is, well, what is Caesar's and what is God's? Because it's give to Caesar what's his and give to God's what's his. Well, what is Caesar's that is not God's? What, 
everything's yeah, God's. Right. So I'm agreeing with you there. So I'm saying when Paul is talking about, you know, doing what the the authorities say and so forth, like, do you think he recognizes, like, he's trying to fly under the radar, but knowing some people are going to read this and think what I'm saying is such and such, but actually that's not what I'm meaning, but I'm writing it this way so as not to ruffle feathers. Could be. The way, you know, the way Jesus answered, like, he knew it was a trap and he said that so that they they couldn't pin it on him. Yeah. Yeah, like Paul didn't want the Roman authorities to intercept his letter and accuse him of um inciting violence or treason or resistance to Caesar or anything like that. Right. So that's what I'm asking. Do you think he was being a bit I don't know no, what word I want. Clever. Um, Coy. I I don't think so. Um I think he's being pretty clear. Um well, there's also examples obviously it's not carte blanche to do every th- evil thing that anybody ever asks of you because there's plenty of examples in scripture of where um, like the midwives in Egypt, um, see, uh, Pharaoh told them to go kill all the male Hebrew babies, and they they refused to do that. And then when he asked them, why didn't you do that? They straight up lied to his face and said, oh, they just give birth too quick before we can get there. Mm-hmm. And then it's uh, the text says that God blessed those midwives and gave them large families right. for disobeying the authority and lying to him mm-hmm. about why they disobeyed. Yep. So th- those... I, I don't think that's in conflict with Romans 13. Oh, right. And like I say, I, I totally get when, you know, the standard libertarian Christian response is to say Paul can't possibly mean what it's, you know, one, you know, the, the prima facie interpretation because, yeah, you go through all the stuff, um, you know, the, the wise men with Herod and everything like that. Um, so, yeah, I, I in, in fact, why is Paul sitting in prison? You know, <laughs> um, so mm-hmm. I, I get that. But like I say, it's the the way you know to to deal with it and say okay because when he says ruler you know he means lawful authority and so therefore anything that's un, unlawful you know is therefore not something again it's I, i'm just wondering well, was also, he, did he know full well that that was going to be interpreted one way but really he meant it this other way right well also whose whose standard of law is paul assuming is he assuming that roman law is the standard of right and wrong or is it god's law that's right and wrong. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I would say Paul's Paul's a uh, a Hebrew of Hebrews, right. of the tribe of Benjamin. He's like seriously, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, super duper versed in the law and all that. Mm-hmm. I don't think he. I think he'd be the last person on earth to say that. Uh, no Roman law supersedes God's law whenever there's a conflict. Sure, sure, yeah. Like, again, I'm totally on board with that. Um, I'm trying to think if there's other. I mean, there. I can understand someone who's a socialist anyway, or, you know, very uh, big welfare state supporter and who also is Christian, why they would read like, you know, Acts of the Apostles and stuff and say, are you libertarians kidding me? How can you possibly think laissez-faire capitalism is the Christian way, you know, they're because they all share their possessions early on and things like that. Yeah, so clearly that, but also, um, you know, and of course the famous, you know, when some of them hold back and then fall over dead. Um, and then, and just too, it's, um, I, I want to choose my words carefully, but one could un- could understandably walk away from the Gospels thinking people who really talk about productive entrepreneurs who create wealth, and that's all they focus on, you know, that they're missing the point like that. You know what I'm saying? So I could see how th- that kind of a person would be very uncomfortable with certain aspects of American libertarianism. Sure. Yeah. There's, I mean, and there's a lot of things cause uh, well, and also this is another subject, but the, the whole idea of capitalism versus crony capitalism. Well, I think the, the only reason that crony capitalism is possible is because we live in a, in sort of, what's attempting to be sort of a dual society of like half socialism and half capitalism. If there really were no government force and regulations, then it would be pure capitalism. Uh, but that's not what we see. And so people sort of confuse current, the current American system as pure capitalism and it's not. And so all the problems that they have with it are really the bits of socialism that are in the society. Yeah. So let me, so I, again, I agree with what you're saying. So to be clear, just in case some of your listeners or my listeners, um, when I share this, think that I'm, uh, you know, engaging in libertarian heresy, not religious heresy, that it's, I, I don't 
disagree with you know where a standard Christian libertarian would come down on these things, but it's um, for for example. Because I've seen some people say it, and Mises says this too. It's interesting. I mean, I guess he was must have been raised Jewish, but you know, I don't, I don't think he was practicing. But he, and I'm paraphrasing. It's been more than a decade since I read this, but Mises says something along the lines of, you know, when you see how um, in the Bible and maybe even like in the medieval times, you know, people were supposed to give alms to the poor. And that was kind of like a Christian duty and things like that, that you need to understand back then, you know, that it, they didn't live in, it wasn't a classical liberal order, you know, that it wasn't modern capitalism. And so back then, if you were locked out of the guild system or whatever, if you, or if you, you know, had some kind of physical handicap, I mean, you were, you were in trouble, or even if you were like a widow, like you were seriously in trouble there, you couldn't just go and take a job at the grocery store and support mm-hmm. yourself. And so, you know, that's, so he, he was kind of saying, you need to interpret some of those passages from the Gospels that on the face of it seem to be pro-welfare state and realize that's because the system was, you know, it was harder for somebody to, to break out of the cycle of poverty, for lack of a better term. And I think that's true, and I understand that, but but by the same token, then when you see like more progressive Christians saying stuff like, oh, well, yeah, the Bible talks about marriage between a man and a woman, but, you know, that's for back then, and nowadays things have changed. You know, I I really am hesitant to go along with that kind of chain of reasoning, and so I'm just I'm just right. trying to be intellectually honest and say, okay, am I just saying I can make a you know a cultural argument when it supports my policy views, but I don't want to go that path and say, oh, that's moral relativism when it when it's something I don't you know, so that kind of thing. Right. Well, there's uh there are some passages in the Old Testament that talk about that actually command charity. But there's also, it's important to note that there's not a penalty for not doing it, like in terms of you go to jail mm-hmm. or um, you have to pay a fine, anything like that. Like um, if you see somebody on the side of the road that's that whose ox has fallen down, you're not allowed to just keep walking. You are obligated to go and help him pick it up. Um, the same thing if you're a farmer. You're supposed to leave the edges of your field unpicked for the people who are destitute to be able to come and pick and eat and survive. Um, that was a mandatory thing. But also, if you disobeyed that, there was no policeman that was going to come and arrest you for failing to uh, leave the edges of your field unharvested. It was, well, God will take care of that, because God's the one who judges nations. Mm-hmm. And so to say, I, I don't want to call those wel- welfare programs, but that... And also, it's like the definition of charity... Well, charity has to be free will, but also God does command it. So it's like, it's an interesting discussion there. Yeah, and I like that distinction you're making. And and that's what I do too in my, you know, when I talk about this stuff is that it's, it, you know, how can I put it? I certainly do think even given, even if we did have a total free market and, you know, it was easier for a, a poor person to support himself by getting a job and that kind of stuff. Still, if somebody's hungry... You know, I, I think Christians are supposed to, with if they have the means, they're supposed to help. Um, but you're, but you're right that that is not the same thing as saying, "Oh, aha!" So, say you support a welfare state after all. That, as you say, no, it's you. Know, you might say, "Okay, that person's not living up to it," but that it does not follow. Therefore, we should have people with guns and cages go ahead and and punish you because you didn't do what you were supposed to do, according to Christianity. Right. Right. Well, there's another thing to be said, too, about like the whole, you know, crime versus a sin thing. Not everything that's a sin is a crime. And I get a lot of pushback on that, uh, which is actually kind of fascinating and sad at the same time. Pushback from Bible believing Christians? From Christians. Yeah. Yeah. Who are like, well, no, because drug dealers are bad people. And so they need to be locked up forever. Yeah. And I guess so I'm curious. I mean, with a lot of this, and I don't know exactly doctrinally how you resolve this, and I think I know it's a thorny question, but there is a lot of that, especially too, like with U.S. foreign policy, and for lack of a better term, let me just say like what what the ancient Israelites were doing versus you know what are modern Christians supposed to do? Because yeah, I, I notice American churches that are you know if they want to justify a bellicose foreign policy or yeah, lock them up approach to crime. They're usually not quoting from the Sermon on the Mount. They're quoting from the Old Testament. 
Right. Right. Um, well, that's a whole, that's a very interesting discussion. And, and on, um, some discussions and things that I've done in separate episodes. It's, this is basically all that we talk about. Um, my, uh, where, I'll let you know a little bit about where I'm coming from. My understanding is that every single law in the old Testament still applies today and we should seek to obey them. Mm-hmm. And the reason for that is because we have been saved. So this isn't a, a works based salvation thing. It's well, Jesus saved me by being obedient to the law. So now I want to go out and be obedient to the law on behalf of other people. And so that the fruit of obedience will actually be one of the things that draws people in to Christianity mm-hmm. and help them see, you know, caring for the widow and the orphan is the fruits of uh, being obedient to everything that God commanded. Now, obviously, some things have changed. Um, Hebrews talks about there was a change in the priesthood when Christ came, so there's necessarily a change in the law. Um, but it's only a change in um, how they're be, to be obeyed. Um, my favorite example is the temple. Um, the old Testament obviously commanded there to be, uh, sacrifices offered in the temple every single day. Uh, well, we still do that in the new covenant, but we have the real temple. I'm a stone of the temple. I'm also a priest and I'm also the sacrifice. So now I'm a fully functioning piece of the temple walking around on two legs. So now everything that I do to give my life to serve other people, that's my daily sacrifice. So it's not that the sacrifices are gone. It's that we have the real deal. The The temple in the Old Testament was only ever a shadow. It wasn't the real mm-hmm. thing. If you'll permit me, Adam, if I could push you once more. Yes, please. I can tell from our discussion, you you know more, you've, you've studied this more deeply than I have, and I, I need to learn this better, but more for the benefit of my listeners who are secular I mean, one of the favorite pastimes of certain anti-religious people on social media is whenever they're arguing with somebody who, like, cites the Bible, they can go to the Old Testament and find some apparently crazy... I love those people. ...rule in there. You know, like, the parent, the, the kid who disobeys his parents should be put to death and, you know, that kind of stuff. Or you can't get tattoos or, you know, things like that. So when you say every law in the Old Testament, I mean... Are are you not allowed to eat pork? You you get where I'm coming from. So can you just clarify what do you mean when you say every law in the Old Testament is still applicable? It's just we're doing it, you know, out of our love for Christ, not because we are afraid that God the Father is going to send us to our room. Right, right. No, I love those people. Like those those people light my fire. Well, you should love um, everybody, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, no, I uh, I love those people in one sense, but also I love that question mm-hmm. because it shows that they're thinking correctly about it. Um, Yes, there's actually a passage, I believe it's in Mark 7, where Jesus actually condemns the Pharisees for not stoning their children who disrespect their parents. Um, Not a lot of people, I guess, for whatever reason, connect that that's what he's talking about. I've seen certain preachers say that, and I thought that was an intriguing uh, interpretation, the word I want, of that. Because, yeah, he doesn't like literally say it, but... You're right. When he says, like, he said, yeah, yeah, Moses said, whoever reviles his father or mother shall be put to death. And he said, but you don't do that. You actually encourage them to revile their parents. And so that's a condemnation that he gives them. The other thing about eating pork is, well, the command was not to eat anything unclean. Mm -hmm. And yeah, in the Old Testament, I believe it was in Leviticus, uh, like 15, 14, something like that. He starts listing all the things that you can't eat. You can't eat shellfish. You can't eat um, any bug except for grasshoppers and locusts, basically, um, that type of stuff. So in the New Testament, um, Jesus made all foods clean. So it's not that we can eat unclean foods now. It's that good luck finding anything unclean to eat because it's all been made clean. Yeah, and for the benefit of our you know listeners who don't know, I mean, Peter was explicitly shown like on the dietary issues. Right. Yeah, the sheet that came, he saw it in a vision, a sheet that came down from heaven three mm-hmm. times and had all sorts of unclean animals in it. And God told Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, well, no, I don't eat anything unclean. And God said, well, what I have called clean, you don't call unclean. And that was sort of a parallel to the gospel being opened up to the Gentiles and the Gentiles being made clean to now be able to be brought into the faith. So can I ask you another follow-up? Because I, I realize this, you're supposed to be asking me, but are you okay if I ask you? <laughs> This yes. is really interesting. Well, that's that was one yeah. of the reasons I was thinking we could divide it into two episodes to where it's like a, <laughs> me drawing stuff out of you for one half and then you drawing stuff out of me for the second half. So um, is it – well, because this also relates to libertarian stuff too. So, I mean, I think this is 
right down the oh, alley yes, or of down the middle of what what you were hoping for. Um, so on that stuff too, like a minute ago, you were saying, you know, ironically and you know perhaps surprising to a lot of people, Jesus was condemning them for not following that. So, I mean, me personally, I don't think, and and you obviously push back if you think that's wrong. I think more Jesus was just showing them you're hypocrites. Do you think you're being such fastidious adherence to the law, but it's more about, you know, tithing and this and that you're not actually, when it would be inconvenient to you, you're not following the strict letter of the law. So it was more like pointing at their hypocrisy. And then again, I, I know it's controversial whether this is actually supposed to be in the gospel or not, but the famous, you know, account of, saying, let him who is without sin cast the first stone, you know. and so, Right, John 8. So anyway, what, what? how do you, so in other words, are you saying you think Jesus actually was lamenting, like, hey, how come you guys aren't going around killing kids with stones, or was it just their hypocrisy he was highlighting? Well, obviously, initially, um, he was condemning them for their adding their own traditions mm-hmm. to things. Um, so they were on top of adding traditions to things, they were also neglecting to do the things that were clearly commanded. Like you're the people who um, you're the, you're the guest of honor at all the feasts, but yet you devour widows houses and, and things like that. So it's a both. I think um, he's condemning them for their traditions, which are adding to all this stuff, which obviously we're told not to add anything as a requirement to the law, but also you can't take away anything either. And they were doing both. Um, so the John eight passage. Um, so yeah, I would use it actually more often. Um, my understanding is that it didn't really appear in a manuscript until 400 years later. So there is a, it's, it feels like it's kind of a toss up. It's, it's 50% chance that it was original and 50% chance that it's not. Um, and when it does appear in manuscripts, it just sort of jumps around all over the book. So it doesn't seem to have a particular place where it, uh, was originally in the book of John, Mm -hmm. but let's, let's assume that it's there. Um, the reason that the woman wasn't stoned is because there weren't any witnesses against her. Uh, when everybody left, Jesus asked the lady, uh, where are your accusers? And she said, there aren't any. And he said, well, then neither do I condemn you to condemn somebody to actually put somebody to death. There may be somebody that's actually worthy of death. But unless you have two or three witnesses that are supposed to cast the first stone, and Jesus was actually quoting out of um, Deuteronomy, I believe, um, that it's the hands of the witnesses that are supposed to be first against the accused. Mm -hmm. So my understanding is that when Jesus said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone, uh, if you take that to mean that only perfect people can condemn in a civil case anybody ever, well, then that means that there should never be any punishment of, of any crime for any reason. Which, okay, if you want to take that, then look at, then that would be a society that has to be very forgiving. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if you take that to mean that, um, well, and obviously I'm very much about forgiveness and atonement. If you take that to mean that, um, the way I understand it is, yes, forgiveness is also very is very important, but also in a civil case, you can't have somebody who is guilty of the same crime be one of the people that condemns the other. That's that's what throwing the the first stone is supposed to prevent against. My understanding is that well, and also where is the man that she was committing adultery with? Right. Was it one of them? Did they was she a prostitute and they all shared her? And that's why they, that's how they knew where to find her. So the implication there is, okay, I'm, I'm assuming that the man who's guilty of adultery with you is among this crowd of people. So whoever throws the first stone needs to stone you and also his fellow who is here among us. And then they all leave. That might seem a bit of a stretch. No, I really, um, th- this is fascinating to me because it is... I mean, with all this stuff, it's like, you know, God's just but merciful and, you know. Well, justice and mercy it, also. It's not that they, it's not that they con- yeah, it's not that they contradict each other, but at first it seems like there's a, a tension and then the more you, you know, reflect on the nature of God and everything, it all kind of comes together and you're just like, whoa, that's so cool. Right. Well, my favorite example is the Sermon on the Mount. And like you said, with m- justice and mercy, those aren't conflicting or incompatible. They're fully compatible with each other. There's no issue. 
Um, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, the turn the other cheek. Um, this is my favorite example that I like to, that I like to give. Um, so in, in the Old Testament, if somebody slapped you on the cheek, what's supposed to happen to the other person that slapped you? Do they slap you twice? No, it's it's eye for eye, tooth for okay. tooth, right? Oh, yeah, I'm getting, I'm so getting if, mixed up with Walter Block. This, that's, that, there's my libertarianism. <laughs> yeah, they, slap, they get to do no, it to you exactly what you did to them. Yeah, Right, right. So it's, it's uh, and the same thing with a false witness. If you accuse somebody of murder and it turns out that you're, you're a false accuser, well, then you get put to death instead because you just attempted to put them to death using the court system. But it was still murder. Your intent was murder. So you should get put to death as a false witness. So with uh, if somebody slaps me on the cheek, justice would be them getting slapped on the cheek. Right. So when Jesus says, so in other words, somebody's got to get slapped on the cheek to pay for what just happened. So when Jesus says, turn the other cheek, it's because I love justice that I'm willing to get slapped again in order to pay for what the other person did. So in other words, justice isn't dependent on me getting justice out of the other person. I can offer it myself. And I was the victim in the first place. Yeah. So that's that's really what's behind turn the other cheek. And this is, yeah. I mean, in it, I realize we're getting into really deep stuff here too. Like obviously, and there, I've seen different preachers take it in different directions with, you know, on, on the one hand, like the standard account of, you know, Christ's atonement and, oh, God's really mad at us because we sinned. And then, oh, but because his son was willing to die for it, you know, like if a human did that in a certain context, that would be monstrous to us. Like they said, that's not justice. He didn't do it. You know what I mean? So like what kind of a sick judge just says, I don't care who I throw in jail, but somebody's got to go to jail for this homicide. Normally, you know, we would say that's what you took. You know, that's crazy. What kind of a judge would do that? But yet, in in this sense, you know, I, I the the more the deep the deeper you go into it, the more it, it it does work. I think, and it it's you know unimaginably merciful and and gorgeous. But you can see how that might strike some people as weird. Yeah, it looks it looks stupid until you're the person that's going to die unless somebody takes your place. <laughs> well, right. So yeah. I, <laughs> that is one thing that I say. And then that, and know. then it's the most wonderfully. Uh, I guess you could say absurd thing in the world because you're the beneficiary of it. Yeah. And this might, might be similar, but sometimes it's funny how atheists will often have two different, you know, on the one hand, they don't like the, oh, this this tyrant of the Bible sends you to hell. Or, and on the other hand, they're like, why would, it, you know, if God's good, why does he allow all this, you know, all this crime and, you know, this injustice to occur? And it's like, well, are you sure you want God to punish everybody for what they did? Are you really sure you want him to do that? Because, you know. The people say demanding that think that they're basically okay. I've got an episode with a with an atheist and cap. His name is Jason DiMartino, and we have this same conversation. So it's like the, it's the story of okay, so somebody's been uh, convicted of rape and murder, and just before the judge sentences him to death, somebody steps in and dies in his place. Uh, and the atheist's response was, "Well, that's stupid. Why would somebody do that for a murderer and a rapist?" And so I let's take it to a little bit more of a simple example. What if I'm at a restaurant and I order some food and then I find out that, oh, I left my wallet at home. I can't pay for what I just ate. And somebody comes over and says, oh, dude, I did, I did that before. Like, here, somebody paid my dinner, so I want to pay for your dinner. And it's taken care of. Like, no atheist would scoff at that. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, when it comes to a matter of life and death, now it's stupid. It doesn't make it. It's not consistent. Uh, yeah, I agree with you there. And I think what's driving the apparent difference is there is something about it's restitution versus retribution, that there's a sense in which the restaurant just wants to get paid, whereas the restaurant doesn't care who pays right. it. Just like, give me my money. Whereas yeah. when you know somebody kills my kid... And if I'm a you know normal person and want vengeance and oh I want that person to die like him dying doesn't bring my kid back and so I guess what you're saying is if you think killing the murderer is going to do something well then why wouldn't killing somebody else do something and 
to me, you know, so I don't know if you know this, Ed, but I'm actually a pacifist. So to me, that would just... Yes, I actually listened to your uh, podcast recently about the privatization of the military and what that would look like and your explanation of, yeah, I don't necessarily agree with it, just like I don't agree with drugs, but that that doesn't mean that we can't talk about what mm-hmm. that would look like. Yeah, so in any event, I'm, I'm to me that... You're right. It does seem weird, but I, I would say the reason, yeah, you're you're hitting these apparent contradictions is there's something odd about, you know, saying, oh, a murderer, you know, in a human context where we should kill the person because, yeah, that doesn't fix it either. But that's so, yes, the, the restaurant analogy or example works great because clearly what the restaurant cares about is getting paid. And so, yeah, if um, yeah, I, I'm agreeing with you, even if it sounds like I'm not. <laughs> I'm yes. just saying if, if the listener yep. has troubles, no, no, there's a huge difference. I, as a pacifist, am pointing out, right, and I think that underscores what's kind of odd about this idea that, oh, when somebody does some violent crime, the way we settle the score is to do that thing right back to that person. That that you know, How does that actually fix things? And that's not necessarily a requirement in God's eyes. God's like, I just want somebody to pay for this. And he wants that so much that he's like, even if I can't get the other person to pay for it, which obviously we can't, He's like, so I'm going to fix it. I was the person that was wronged in the first place. And I'm going to also provide the means to fix it and make it right. And God can obviously do that in terms of life and death. Christ died and and rose again. Uh, When I die, I don't rise again. I rise in Christ. And so it's sort of a flip-flop there. But also now I can show the spirit of that in if somebody wrongs me, Forgiveness isn't, okay, that's that's fine, like I forgive you. Forgiveness is, no, I also have to pay the penalty for what that person did. On top of, um, Muslims have a, have a very different understanding of this. Um, their view of forgiveness is that you do something wrong and then the consequences just disappear. Like, if, if anybody should sort of recoil and marvel at the stupidity of that, it should be an economist like you. <laughs> Who's like, okay, when somebody steals something from Walmart, Walmart just doesn't absorb that cost. No, they pull it from somewhere else. It's got to come from somewhere. Huh. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, just, I don't know enough about Islam to even say anything intelligent in response. They don't really have a concept of atonement. Um, atonement is, okay, yeah, I suffered the penalty, but somebody has to pay for it. Mm-hmm. And in Islam, they, they Islam totally rejects that. They just say, well, no, it just... It, it, nothing happens when, when evil is done and, or forgiven. So like, in other words, me forgiving somebody for slapping me on the cheek is not to slap them back. That's Islam. Christianity is no, I have to turn the other cheek and offer to get slapped again or else it's, it hasn't been made right until that happens. Huh? That's, that's very interesting. I had never heard that, uh, angle on that passage. Um, oh, there was, oh, there was this one question. This has been bugging me for a long time. Um, so I read an article. I can't remember where it was. Um, it was on Google, so I know it's, it's probably reliable. <laughs> um, when um, the government stops forcing interest rates and, and regulating them, um, I read that it will naturally hover around 20% annually. Is that, is that true? Do you know anything about that? I mean... No, I, it's, I, I would say it's not true. Um, I, I'm, I'm not even sure where, what the, what you could have read. I mean, because even a long time ago, like they, I, I think the general idea in, you know, standard economic models of this and, you know, historical evidence is that initially, you know, in a relatively poor society, interest rates are pretty high. And then as, as they accumulate capital goods, and you know we sort of we sort of push out the the range of provision, and so um, you know as as a society gets richer per capita at least, interest rates tend to come down because less people are seeking to borrow money. Basically, um, I mean it, it's not so much that less people, but that the the, the supply is greater as well. Y- yeah, like so the, the people lending have more to lend, like they're more able to. I mean, I'm speaking loosely here, obviously. Um, but yeah, the the people who are because what, what's happening when you're borrowing is like somebody is giving you present goods in exchange for you promising to give them future goods down the road. So the more amply we're provided for in the present, the less urgently we need present goods, and so you know we're more willing to part with them on cheaper terms. 
if that makes sense. Yes, interesting. So if if the the Fed stopped forcing the interest rates to be so low, where do you do you have any sort of an idea of where they might hover naturally at this point in time? Boy, uh Again, it, it, I guess that's kind of an yeah, impossible question I mean, because you have right, to know like, yeah, all, you, all market information in the United States. To yeah, it's that. it's like yeah, somebody in the Soviet Union or North Korea said if we got rid of this, you know, how much would tomatoes cost? You know, I, I, I mean, there, I guess I could look at other <laughs> tomato prices in freer countries to get in a ballpark. Um, if you if you want me to just throw out a number, I would say on very safe short term loans, probably like five percent, something like that. Would be my guess. Okay, so that was a uh, how, do, how do you say a dud question? <laughs> um, I, I wanted to. I, I also wanted to thank you. Um, one of the one of the articles that was sort of instrumental was actually um, I just recently went and looked back at it, and I realized that you were the author of it. Um, it was an article on Mises called "Law Without the State" uh, that you wrote back in 2011, or was published in 2011. So I read that probably four or five years ago. And I loved your angle in there about like looking what would insurance look like to help people be able to deal more smoothly with either untrusted people or I just thought that was a really good article. And I'd never heard anybody try to incorporate insurance before that. I read that article. Oh, I I appreciate that. Yes. Just to give. So as far as private military defense, they're like Rothbard and Hoppe and maybe others, too. It was standard that they thought insurance companies would be involved, and they might be one of the ones that would, like, would provide the bulk of the the funding for that. Um, but yeah, for whatever reason, when it comes to just you know what you guys call crim- domestic criminal law, that sort of thing, um, for whatever reason, insurance companies, I, I, I know I didn't get it from somebody else. But I'm not saying I'm the first person that ever wrote that up, but I know that was you know I came on that idea myself, and it. It just for your listeners who don't have any frame of reference, it's like um, right now, you know, surgeons, if they if they uh, operate and they do something really negligent and the person dies in the operating table and they get sued for malpractice, they have malpractice insurance. And that's what covers it. Right. So it doesn't come out of the doctor's checking account. And for one thing, the doctor might not have that much money lying around if it's a huge judgment. And so, and you can just walk through and see, oh, yeah. So in order to get malpractice insurance, you'd have to have gone to medical school you know, you got to be working per- perhaps at a reputable hospital or surgical outpatient center and things like that. You know, otherwise the insurance company's not just going to be on the hook for any, you know, botched operation this guy or woman performs. And you can just see how that would sort of self-regulate and that would be another layer of protection. So people would know, don't go and get operations for someone unless they have medical malpractice insurance provided by a big company. So once you see how that works right now in the real world, this isn't science fiction. Right. That principle, I'm saying, if if there weren't the state sitting there punishing violent criminals or thieves, that kind of principle would apply more generally. And it might not be an insurance company. It might be like a fraternal organization. Like, you join this group that vouches for you. And so if you get proved in a reputable court that you did something and you skip town, well, then, you know, your your brothers, mm-hmm. you know, rectify, you know, they take, you know, they compensate the victim and then maybe they go try to hunt you down, that kind of thing. More like a voluntary union or a, a guild, something yeah, exa- like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you could see it, you know, being an insurance company or you know, different avenues. It might take different forms, but but you're right. So that you're part of a, a larger group that has the means to compensate anybody that you wrong, and that helps keep you honest, right? Because in order in order for them to take you into their ranks, they're going to vet you and whatever. So th- this is why. You know, every time you go to enter a mall, it's not like they have to go do a, a background check on you. You just flash your badge or whatever saying, oh, I'm, you know, I'm part of this fraternal organization. Oh, yeah, come on in. That kind of thing. Right. Right. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think some of those insurance things I would I would disagree with, but there, it's because I have rather extreme views on slavery and things like that. Or indentured servitude, I know some people prefer to say it as. Um, but like if a, a malpractice thing, like if uh, somebody was negligent, something that they known, I don't know if that they'd be able to get insurance for that. But if it was something that was either unavoidable or uh, unforeseeable in terms of surgery, then yeah, insurance could definitely cover those because they'd obviously be a lot more rare. And also um, having having negligence insurance, I think might encourage some people to not be as uh, careful as they should be for certain things. 
but yeah, for like huge debts and stuff, um, I actually think um, selling people's debts and basically garnishing their wages is a pretty effective way to do things. But right, yeah, and with all that, it's who, and it ties into uh, like a private prison and a free society, and how would that work? You know, is it even logically possible? And yeah, you could imagine if people were such pariahs, you know, some guy is an axe murderer, and um, so I do think legally they would have the victims would have the right to kill him. So as a Christian, I I don't think that's the right thing to do, but legally I think that's yeah you'd be able to do that. But it's, instead, you could imagine the family just said, okay, well, you know, I, I think it would rapidly move towards judgments of, of financial compensation that they would say, okay, you, you know, pay them a, a million dollars. Yeah. Instead of, you know, the, the, in other words, they would say, we, we could demand your life, but instead, if you give us a million dollars, we, you know, we'll sell this back to you kind of thing. And then there could be, you know, but who would want a convicted you know, murderer living among them? And so, yeah, there could be communities where they, you know, they build a secure facility, but you could go there and work and, they make sure you're not carrying a shiv on you and stuff like that. But so it's like, you know, we nowadays look at it and might say, oh, that's a prison. But there would be a lot of them and it would be, in a sense, voluntary because they'd go to live there. So, like, if the guards were mistreating you, you would just go to a different one. That kind of thing. I find it so interesting, that all of these discussions and that there are a lot of atheists in these camps, too, that when you finally get down to it and you see the, all the problems in society that lead you to these conclusions and talking about these subjects these are all the things that the Pentateuch talks about, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, what to do if somebody kills somebody and are you allowed to ransom a murderer's life for money? Right. Exactly. Um, There's very clear instructions on all of that stuff and, you know, slavery, indentured servitude. And what does it look like if you own somebody's life? Yep. I love that. And also too, I mean, it's not the same thing, but I really like as an economist who does a lot on, you know, like present discounted value and stuff like that with, when the year of Jubilee is approaching and how if you're selling somebody land, you got to adjust for the fact that, wait a minute, there's only three years left in this. And the, that stuff's just amazing to an economist reading it. It's it's I think it's really sad that people are sort of scared of the Old Testament and the things that it talks about because they don't. Well, it's like, well, I feel like I'm right at home with all the anarcho capitalists because they're the people that are talk want to talk about all the um, really like long term out there changes that need to happen that are very countercultural at this point. So it was a real pleasure talking to you. Yeah, it was a pleasure talking to you too, Adam. Thanks so much.